Hello everyone and welcome to the Respiratory Channel. Today we're going to go over esophageal balloons and do some board work. So, esophageal balloons, let's get to it. Realistically, what are we trying to do? We're trying to find out the bag in the box. Synonymous with us. So the bag we take as our lungs, the box is our thorax. Now we always know what's happening within the bag. We have ventilators to tell us all these fancy numbers. So, but we've never really known what's going on in the box. Uh, ironically, mechanical ventilation is actually somewhat guesswork because we're only know, we only know one side of the equation. An esophageal balloon will actually allow us to figure out the other side. So what we're trying to really do is figure out the pressures that are going from the bag through the box. Those pressures are known as our transpulmonary pressures. And a trans your transpulmonary pressure is actually equal to two things. The pressure in the bag and the pressure in the box. So what we have is transpulmonary pressure is equal to the pressure within our alveoli minus the pressure in our pleural space, okay? We don't have catheters for alveoli, but we do have a ventilator, and it'll give us airway pressures. That said, airway pressures are kind of generic, so we need something more specific, and we need a point at which there is zero flow, so we need a static measurement. In order to do that, we have to pause our breath, to get those static measurements. There's two points in the respiratory cycle which actually facilitate that. One is a PEEP measurement to identify what our total PEEP is. The other is our plateau measurement. So that's one half of the equation. Now the other half is our pleural pressures. They do have pleural catheters, but that seems like a lot of invasive work to get a pleural pressure. So what are we talking about? Well, what do we have that runs through the box but outside the bag? We have our esophagus. And if we have a catheter that sits in our esophagus but is outside of our lungs, then we can isolate that and actually get pleural pressures. Okay. So pleural pressures are equal to esophageal pressures. Now at this point, this is all great, but realistically, we have two more steps to do. Step number one is to find out, is our bag inflated? Are our lungs inflated? And step number two is, what is the true pressure being reflected on the bag? So step one is our transpulmonary peep. This filling in our surrogates we can identify by finding out our total peep minus our esophageal pressure. And what is our target? Our target we want is a value greater than or equal to zero. So let's have our patient here we have now we know our total PEEP is 10, but we put in our esophageal catheter and we actually find our pleural pressure is 20, our esophageal pressure is 20. Let's put this into our equation. So we have 10 minus 20 equals, sorry, minus 10. This makes sense. Right? There is more pressure in the box than there is in the bag, which means the bag will get crushed. Right? So, what do we need to do? We need to increase our PEEP to get to zero. And to do that, we would increase our PEEP from 10 to 20. And this makes sense because. 20 is equal to 20. The pressures are now equal 
in the bag in the box. Therefore, your lung can now be open. Now, at this point, because you've probably already got a lot of atelectasis on board, we recommend doing a recruitment maneuver to actually get the lung nice and open and have uh, a greater functioning number of units to apply to the next step. Okay. So, is our bag open initially? No, but now it is. We then go to step two, is to find the true stretch on the bag. Historically, we've gone through ARDS and the ARDSnet protocols to target plateau pressures of less than 30 centimeters of water. Well, that only takes the one part of that equation because you know if you have something pushing against another, you may not actually be attaining those true stretch uh, values that the tissue would see. So here we're trying, we're going to identify our transpulmonary plateau. Using our surrogates, we need to identify our plateau pressure and subtract our esophageal pressure. Now our target for this is less than 25 centimeters of water. Now I say less than, not less than or equal to. So in fact, we can go less than or equal to 24 centimeters of water. So if we have our patient here, and we've identified that, well, we have our, our PEEP, or sorry, we've identified our, our esophageal pressure is already 20, but now we do a plateau measurement. And we get a value of 40. Any RT worth their salt would know that a plateau pressure of 40 is something pretty astronomical, right? Most of the time we would always target to be less than 30 or else we know we're going to be dealing with troubles down the road, okay? But now we know the other side of the equation, right? So let's plug that in. So our plateau pressure is 40 and our esophageal pressure we know is 20. Well, this gives us a value of 20. So what does that mean though? That means we have four centimeters of water to actually play with to either optimize our oxygenation, we could go up on our PEEP, or if we have ventilation issues, we could go up on our PIP. Okay. So that's how that figures out. Now what we need to do is have some examples of what kind of patients we would actually see and we can utilize this on, okay? Patient number one, we are morbid obese, okay? So if we were to assume or guess what their transpulmonary peak would be, Well, we all know we're fairly conservative with our PEEP and nine times out of ten, we're not applying enough. So with our morbid obese, we would actually guess that we would be at a negative value, okay? Minus two, something like that, okay? It might be close, but we're not optimizing, right? So then we would go to step two and look at our transpulmonary plateau. What do you think? Well, if we look at it in two different ways, our transpulmonary peep is really more reflective of what's going outside the lung, whereas our transpulmonary plateau is actually trying to tell us what is happening to the lung. Is the lung normal or is it sick? Well, just because you're morbidly obese, chances are your lung is not sick. We're normal. So we would kind of expect a low value, maybe 8 to 12, okay? This is reflective in that, well, we have a lot of pressures, right? We can really get their lungs open and then get them off the vent and we're not starting from scratch. We're not starting from less than optimal when we actually go to extubate. Okay. Now our second patient, say, 
H1N1, okay? Sick lung, right? Patient comes in. And this is a guess, but maybe negative, maybe zero, okay? <clears throat> maybe you actually hit your peak target, right? Great. Moving on to step two. Well, they have a sick lung. We know that, right? So we might expect a high value. Okay. Okay. So what does that mean? That means we could have five centimeters of water to actually play with to optimize our patient, right? We have room. So then we go to our well, worst case scenario. Let's say it's a severe H1N1 and obese. Okay? Well, if you're lucky, you'd be hitting your target. Okay, um, but you never know, okay? You could be negative. And then you go to check their plateau. And you find it's 30. But then you think, wait a minute, that needs to be less than 25. So what do you do? Well, we're kind of maxed out. We know that there's a lot of pressure acting outside the lung, but we know the lung is also very damaged. There's not much more we can do. We can prone them. We can likely add epoprostenol. We could potentially add nitric. Um, but in this scenario, we are unable to optimize them any further. So our recommendation would be for ECMO. But if that's the case, there is a finite window of time that they would be able to do so, and that would depend on your medical director. So this covers the board work. Uh, in our next video, we'll likely go into putting everything together and doing some measurements and the occlusion test. Please stay tuned. Thank you.